After my last video correcting Tony Heller's attempts at fact-checking, his immediate response was, he really is a glutton for punishment. But for me, fact-checking isn't a punishment at all. I welcome it because I want to make my videos as factually accurate as possible. If I've got something wrong, I want to know about it. And if even the most determined attempt to find a fault in my videos can't find a single error, that's even better. Since science is about facts rather than personal opinion, I'm glad that through this video debate, which entails fact-checking and asking for sources, people are beginning to see which claims are supported and which claims have been shown to be wrong or are still unsupported. So let's just get up to speed. These are the issues we've been discussing that have now been resolved. To read them, just pause the video. And these are the ones Tony still disputes. So these are the ones I'll deal with in the second round of this debate. Let's go through his second round video and look at the things he still disputes. Milinkovic was a Serbian astronomer who early in the last century came up with a very plausible theory for the cosmos. The first six so. minutes are filled with an explanation of who Milankovitch was and why we get summers and winters. Then Tony read from an Indiana University website which explains what Milankovitch cycles are. All this can be found on Wikipedia, so let's skip to the part where Tony disputes what I said. It's of primary importance to explain that climate change and subsequent periods of glaciation resulting from the following three variables is not due to the total amount of solar energy reaching Earth. The three Milinkovitch cycles impact the seasonality and location of solar energy around the Earth, thus impacting contrasts between the seasons. Let's look closely at his claim from the professional paper he's citing. The total insulation received by Earth has varied by less than 0.7 watts per meter. But this is junk science. As I just pointed out from the Indiana University website, total solar insulation is irrelevant. But the authors of the paper make exactly the same point. The reason Tony calls it junk science is because he misread the paper. The authors say exactly the same thing as the Indiana University website, that the obliquity of the Earth's axis and the precession of the equinoxes strongly affect the distribution of available energy between latitudes and seasons. For example, the variation of the summer insulation at 65 degrees north. But what they found is that even if you include the responsive ice sheets, which was Milankovitch's theory regarding the 65 degree north latitude, that's still not enough feedback to explain the glacial cycles. What may explain it, say the authors, is the data from recent ice core samples showing a likely increase of CO2 and methane, which are powerful greenhouse gases. They show their figures, they cite their sources, and their conclusions have since been confirmed by other studies that I cited in my last video. Just saying they're wrong is not much of an answer. So Milankovitch's basic idea is accepted by researchers, but like all theories, every detail is not carved in stone. Since Milankovitch proposed it 90-odd years ago, researchers have been able to accurately date these glacial cycles and discovered that Milankovitch cycles don't make a perfect fit. Lots of new evidence has emerged in the last nine decades, such as other orbital cycles, ice core data and so on. From this new data, researchers have calculated that changes in insulation and the positive feedback of ice albedo alone can't explain the advance and retreat of ice sheets. Other feedback factors like carbon dioxide and methane have to be added. And for all those who would much rather hear my personal theories, why? Like Tony, I'm a complete amateur in this field. If you want to know what amateurs believe, their theories are all over YouTube. If you want to know what the scientific research has found, well, this is it. In my first video, I showed Potholer criticizing Al Gore. My criticism of Potholer was centered around the fact that he just blew off Al Gore as being someone irrelevant. Actually, that's not what you said. You said this. What he blew over in his discussion was that Al Gore said the exact opposite. He tried to make it sound like CO2 drove the temperature. And I answered that by showing how I didn't brush over it at all. Clearly. In his film An Inconvenient Truth, Al Gore used a graph like this to show a correlation between carbon dioxide levels and increased temperatures. But he obscured the fact that the carbon dioxide increases lag the temperature increases by 800 years. So now that we're up to speed, let's deal with what Tony mistakenly thinks he said. Did I assert that Al Gore is irrelevant? 
As usual, Tony doesn't play a clip, so I'll just have to tell you what I think. I think Al Gore's very relevant to the public perception of climate science because he's a high-profile figure and millions of people saw his movie. And he's clearly relevant to people who believe whatever he says. And that's why I corrected his claims. But Gore is completely irrelevant in the science world because he isn't a professional researcher in this field and he isn't publishing any studies. So his claims should not be cited as scientific fact in newspapers or TV programs or be passed off as the conclusions of professional researchers. By the way, I started making videos about climate science 10 years ago and the very first one included a criticism of Al Gore's CO2 claim, which I just showed you. The second one and the fourth one in the series also included corrections of his claims, like this one. If Greenland broke up and melted, or if half of Greenland and half of West Antarctica broke up and melted, this is what would happen to the sea level in Florida. Well, yes, but it's rather like saying that if the Rockefeller Center turned into a banana split, ice cream would melt all over Fifth Avenue. The crucial question is, how likely is that to happen? Let's look more closely at Al Gore's claim about a 20-foot rise in sea levels. The important word here, of course, is if. Gore isn't exactly lying. If these ice sheets melted, then yes, we could get a 20-foot rise in sea levels, although more recent research suggests the figure would be less. But no climate scientist is saying it'll happen any time soon. At current warming rates, the data show it'll take at least a thousand years for the Greenland ice sheet to completely melt, and thousands more for the West Antarctic ice sheet to melt. So let's get back to the ever-shortening list of things I supposedly got wrong. Now let's look at another appeal to authority by Potholer. Potholer is describing a single, very controversial paper by Shakun as if that represented the opinion of the scientific community. Many scientists have poked holes in Shakun's work, and it's pretty much irrelevant to the discussion anyway. Actually, those scientists Tony is talking about later retracted their criticisms and agreed that the Shakun paper was correct after all. To all those watching, is what I've just said true? How do you know? Unless I give you a source, in other words, show who these scientists are and where they made this retraction, you have no way of fact-checking it. I have no idea if it's true or even if these scientists exist, because Tony hasn't given his source either. So I can't fact-check it. This is why it's important to cite sources to allow people to fact-check assertions. If many scientists have poked holes in the Shakun paper, then they'll be in comment papers among the 658 citations of Shakun's paper listed in the scientific literature. So all Tony has to do is cite the titles, authors, dates of publication and journals of these comment papers in his next response. The same way I always cite my sources when I make a claim. But let's step back a bit. Tony calls my citing of this scientific study an appeal to authority. As anyone who's ever studied graduate-level science knows, citing peer-reviewed papers is standard practice in science. Not doing so would get you an F. And at the end of every scientific paper that's published is a list of citations, because that's how science is done. An appeal to authority is completely different. It's insisting that a claim is true simply because a valid authority or expert on the issue said it was true without any supporting evidence offered. To give a real example, it's like saying... Dr. David Viner is a clever man with a PhD. David Viner says there'll be no more snow in Britain. So there'll be no more snow in Britain. Viner is indeed an authority, but he didn't publish or cite a peer-reviewed study showing evidence to support that claim. So that's what's known as an argument from authority. The irony is that when Tony does give his sources, <laughs> they all take their data from peer-reviewed papers, even if he didn't realise it. Let's move on to the next unresolved issue. Anyway, his valid criticism was that I used a 10C change in temperature for a 100 parts per million change in CO2. And his point was, yes, it was 10C change in Antarctica, but that wasn't the change in global temperature. Actually, my point was that Tony claimed I said that a 10 degree rise in temperature was caused by a 100 degree rise in CO2, which he now accepts I didn't say. <laughs> 
And my other point was that it was Tony himself who came up with this figure by getting a graph off the internet and not fact-checking what the temperature data referred to. So that led to his mistaken belief that these are global temperatures. In fact, they're Antarctic temperatures, which he now accepts he got wrong. This is the graph he was referring to. It's not really very hard to find this graph. It's the first thing that comes up when you type in Antarctic ice core graphs. He tries to make it sound like I'm hiding something, but this is just the standard data from the ice cores, and I just assumed that he knew how to use Google. Tony's right in saying it's not hard to find this graph, as I showed. What requires a bit more intelligence, or knowing how to use Google, as Tony puts it, is finding out where this graph originated. In my last video, I showed how I tracked it down. When I got to the source data, I found that Tony's assumption that these are global temperatures was wrong. I'm not suggesting you're hiding anything, Tony. I'm prepared to accept that you didn't know how to fact-check this graph, or didn't realise why fact-checking is important. But I hope you now do appreciate that by not tracking down the source of the data, you made a mistake in interpreting it. This graph is from the 1990 IPCC report, and it shows about a 5C swing in temperature between ice ages and interglacials. That's about half of what the Antarctic ice cores show. Using even the highest estimates of climate sensitivity from the IPCC report, you could only account for about 1C swing in temperature from the 100 parts per million change in carbon dioxide. So the vast majority of the change can't be due to carbon dioxide. It has to be due to something else. But as we've seen, it's not carbon dioxide alone. But I'm glad that this time Tony's not claiming that I said that 5 degrees of warming was caused by a 100 parts per million increase of CO2, because of course I didn't. I'm going to explain this again very simply, and hopefully this time even Potholer will be able to understand. Methane only has three small, narrow spectral spikes, and only two of any significance. And both of these small, narrow spectral spikes of methane overlap with the very tall, broad spectrum of water vapor. Water vapor is a much more potent greenhouse gas than nearly irrelevant methane. But all the measurements and studies show exactly how relevant methane is. Repeating your unsubstantiated claim, even when laced with sarcasm, is still just an unsubstantiated claim. If science was just a question of saying you believe something isn't true, I could just as easily say, yes it is. And you could say, no it's not. I can say, yes it is, and we can keep batting back and forth until one of us gives up. I showed the actual figures for methane's radiative forcing, the figures for its absorption wavelengths for infrared radiation, the figures for its longevity, and the figures for its comparative concentration in the atmosphere. And I showed the sources of all these figures. So if Tony thinks they're wrong, it's no good just saying, I think they're wrong. He needs to cite studies that also show facts and figures. Because that's how science is done. And here's the kicker. Even the Indiana University website that Tony used as a source lists methane as a significant greenhouse gas. If carbon dioxide feedback produced a gain of more than one, it would become the driver of climate. It would go out of control and you'd never be able to get out of an ice age. Or when you started out of an ice age, you'd never be able to stop and you'd end up like Venus. Well, I already explained this in my last video. Not because this is my theory, but because this is what researchers have found. Their conclusions are based on some fairly basic principles of physics. Once again, Tony's only response is to claim that he's right and they must all be wrong. So that doesn't really advance things very far. If he can come up with a study that says we should have had runaway warming and the oceans should have boiled, then I'll be very glad to look at it. So where do we now stand on the remaining issues? Forcing duty CO2 and methane did not contribute to glacial cycles? Well, the paper that Tony said was junk science was the result of him misreading it. All the scientific studies I've cited, even the source of one of the graphs Tony cited, say they did. Tony's argument that this wasn't part of Milankovitch's theory over 90 years ago is very interesting history, but researchers have discovered a lot more since then. His claim that I blew over Al Gore's misleading speech about CO2 correlation, as we've seen for the second time, I didn't. Methane is not a significant greenhouse gas. Again, all the scientific studies I've cited show otherwise, and the authors of these studies have measurements and figures to back that up.
Tony hasn't cited any studies that contradict this. Tony, you're now suggesting you want to end this online fact-checking debate about the things I supposedly got wrong, which of course is your prerogative because you began it. I'm very glad that by digging up sources and fact-checking, we've been able to see that the list of things I supposedly got wrong turned out to be errors on your part. Misquotes of what I said, claims that I didn't show things in my videos that in fact I did show, your misreading of scientific papers, and your misunderstanding of graphs. I do understand why you see citing sources and fact-checking as punishment. It is a bit tedious, it takes more time, but it does expose errors. So please look on it as a positive, not a negative. You say that you don't have time to respond in this fact-checking format, so why not take a few days to do it like I do? Instead of rushing out a video in a single day and getting your facts wrong, why not take the time to fact-check the sources I give, and more importantly, take the time to find sources for your claims so that everyone watching can fact-check them also? Hate to say it, but that is how science is done.